Mr. Morali. Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, I declare my interest as a practicing lawyer. The Small Claims Tribunal Amendment Bill introduces various amendments to the Small Claims Tribunal Act aimed to expand and enhance both the jurisdiction and powers of the Small Claims Tribunal, SCT. The amendments reflect the rising costs of living and therefore the quantum of disputes and also promotes greater access to justice through the quick and relatively inexpensive forum of the SCT. The bill is introduced after public consultation on the proposed amendments. The approach taken by the Ministry of Law in involving members of public to give feedback on the bill before it is debated here is particularly commendable. I support the amendments and take the opportunity to make a few short points on the proposed amendments. First, Section 26 and 27 of the Small Claims Tribunal Act presently allows for the consolidation of claims involving a common question of fact or law as well as representative claims or class action claims. Clauses 12 and 13 of the bill amends these sections to clarify that the aggregate value of the class action or consolidated claims does not exceed the monetary limits prescribed by the Act. I understand that the amendments are proposed out of a recognition that the SET may not be equipped to deal with a large number of consolidated claims whose total aggregate value may exit or rather exceed the SCT's limit by a large margin. However, there is a danger that the proposed amendments, which links the combined value of the claims to SCT's monetary jurisdiction for a single case, may substantively impact on the original policy behind the statutory intent to allow consolidation of claims as enshrined in the provisions as it stands now. The main rationale underlying the consolidation of proceedings is to ensure an efficient hearing of related actions under a common umbrella. This can be done through trying all the cases in one go or trying a test case where the court's findings may bind the rest of the parties in the consolidated action. Where there are claims giving rise to common questions of law or fact or that arise out of the same events, there is compelling logic to have the same tribunal to have the power to order that the claims be heard together. Apart from savings of time and resources, there is also an issue of substantive fairness and justice, namely to militate against inconsistent findings of fact by different tribunals arising from the same events. I am also concerned about the practical effect on the resources of the SCT, which may consequently have no choice but to hear cases arising from the same subject matters separately. Given that the order of consolidation is a discretionary judicial remedy, I wonder if it is, would have been better to leave it to the SCT to decide whether or not to grant the order, having regard to all the circumstances of the case, including the specific kind of issues involved and whether it is equipped to deal with these issues. Another intermediate solution would be to provide for a higher limit for the aggregate value of consolidated or class action claims so that a balance can be struck between the two competing policies that I have identified. <coughs> Second, clause 15 of the bill repeals section 35 to 37 of the Act and introduces a new section 35 that expands and improves the types of orders that the SCT may make. In particular, the proposed amendment aims to provide the SCTs the power to order a party to pay costs where the SCT thinks fit to do so. In the Ministry's public consultation paper, it was explained that this was to enhance SCT's case management powers since Section 31 and 32 of the Act presently provides that no costs shall be awarded save in respect of frivolous or vexatious claims. Proceedings before the SCT, as pointed out by the Honourable Member Mr. Christopher de Souza, excludes representation by a lawyer. As explained by the then Minister for Labour and Second Minister for Law and Home Affairs, Professor S. Jayakumar, to this House in 1984, to ensure that a litigant will not be at a disadvantage because he is unable to afford legal representation and to keep costs to a minimum, 
parties are to present their own case. This is why it is provided that unless a claim is frivolous or vexatious, no costs apart from disbursements may be awarded. In these circumstances, since no legal representation is allowed before the SCTs, how is a party's cost to be judged and quantified? Finally, how can we ensure that the practice of awarding costs under the new provision would not discourage litigants with bona fide claims from presenting their claims in the tribunal for fear of being penalised in costs. And I believe this is the same point that's raised by the Honourable uh, Member of Parliament, Mr. Christopher D'Souza, earlier too. The proposed new Section 35 of the Act will also now empower the SCT to order vacant possession of premises in cases involving unpaid rent by a tenant. This is in addition to an order for the tenant to pay outstanding rent, notwithstanding that the SCT's jurisdiction is only in respect of claims relating to a contract for short-term lease of residential property not exceeding two years. An order for possession which may be enforced by a writ of possession is, I would suggest, an onerous remedy against a tenant. It also, in effect, deals with a subject matter in form of the rest that exceeds or usually exceeds the SCT's monetary jurisdiction. In fact, as it stands, under Section 52, Subsection 1A of the State Courts Act, even the Magistrates Court, which is a forum where parties may have legal representation, does not have the civil jurisdiction to hear and try action where there is no claim for any sum of money or the relief sought in addition to the claim amount is in respect of a subject matter which exceeds the Magistrate Court's limit. I am concerned whether the SCT is the best forum to determine this issue, especially since parties do not have legal representation. The Honourable Senior Minister of State would know that when it comes to orders of delivering vacant possession, it's associated with also the calculation of MESNI profits in the situation of holding over or calculation of double rent under the Civil Law Act. So these are issues that perhaps the SCT may not be able to handle. Will there be any safeguards? put in place to minimize the risk of injustice in form of allowing such orders to be appealable as a matter of right, or to provide guidance to the SCT on when the power to order vacant possession should be exercised. Third, Section 38 of the present Act provides that there will be no appeal to the High Court against the SCT's decision unless it involves a question of law or jurisdiction. In addition, leave to appeal must be granted by the District Court before an appeal may be brought. Clause 16 of the bill proposes to amend this section to allow the District Court to, in cases where leave to appeal is refused, order that the matter be remitted back to the same tribunal for reconsideration or that the case be reheard by a different tribunal. It appears that the effect of the proposed amendments is to give the District Court supervisory jurisdiction over the SCT. However, this seems to be inconsistent with Section 19, Subsection 3 of the State Courts Act which explicitly states that the District Court does not have supervisory jurisdiction. May I please seek clarification on the basis of this proposed amendment and how the proposed amendments to allow the District Court to remit the matter back to the SCT for, re for rehearing may be reconciled with this point. Further, the proposed amendments would allow a case to be reheard on a ground involving issues of fact. This effectively expands the scope for an appeal by allowing a rehearing of cases on the basis of a question of fact. This approach seems to be different from the approach taken by the Ministry in 2005, where the then Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Law, Professor S. Jayakumar, stated that the scope for an appeal was deliberately narrowed in order to promote finality and to avoid the high costs in appealing that may exceed the sums in dispute. Could the Honourable Senior Minister of State please clarify if the approach has changed? And if so, why is there a need to expand the scope for appeal. Notwithstanding the clarificatory points that I've raised, I support the bill.